We begin with the penitential order on page 351. In Lent, we begin our worship with the confession. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. Jesus said the first commandment is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Our service continues with the Trisagion, which we sing. It's in the green hymnal on page 845. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. 
Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of the world, our hearts may surely there be fixed, where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. first lesson today is from the book of Ezekiel. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put your spirit, my spirit, within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church. We will read Psalm 130 responsively by a whole verse. Out of the depths have I called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears consider well the voice of my supplication. For there is forgiveness with you, therefore you shall be feared. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. With him there is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give you, will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. Hear what the spirit is saying to the church.
Our sequence hymn is number 628 in the blue hymnal. <laughs> It's another long story like last week, and if you listen better without tired legs, do sit. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother, Lazarus, was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. <clears throat> then after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, he has fallen asleep. He will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought he was merely referring to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, <clears throat> and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will bring you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. And they followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, 
If you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of one holy triune God of love. Amen. Today's stories are so rich, particularly the Valley of Dry Bones and the Rising of Lazarus, right? The Lazarus story, to a large degree, speaks for itself. But Dry Bones could use a little backstory before we dive into both of them. The prophet, Ezekiel, was a Jewish priest and prophet among the Jews who were taken into captivity in Babylonia in the 6th sixth, sixth century BCE. His people had lost their freedom, they had been violated, and they had experienced great loss. This is the time from which the words of Psalm 137 were formed. How can we sing our song in a strange land? The people were completely depleted and oppressed in every way and had no hope. In this context, Ezekiel <clears throat> excuse me, had a vision in which he saw himself in a valley full of dry bones speaking with God. And God asked him if these bones that he saw all around him could live again. And Ezekiel said that he didn't know, that only God knew. But Ezekiel did as God asked him to do. He spoke hope to the valley of dry bones. And as he watched, those bones rattled themselves together and began to grow sinew and muscles and flesh. And then the spirit of God, and the word spirit is the same as breath, or wind in, in the Hebrew. The Spirit of God blew through that valley and blew breath into each body, and they rose and breathed and came into fullness of life, resurrected from the bonds of oppression. And then, about 600 years later, Jesus stood at the tomb of his dear friend Lazarus, stone rolled away, and his friend, who had been dead for four days, to the point where there was a stench, his friend came out and was resurrected and knew. Now at our staff meeting this week, Katie was telling us about a liturgical guide that she was recently reading that explained how a church could act out the stories that we read during our Easter vigil, one of which is the Valley of Dry Bones. The liturgical guide suggested having people dressed as skeletons laying around on the church floor and then slowly arising to be robed and then to start dancing and singing and making their way out as the story finishes. I actually heard after the eight o'clock service that John Strand did something like this once. More than once. <laughs> Himself on the floor. 
<laughs> with lots of youth involvement. I heard it was amazing. And I don't think we're going to do that in two weeks at our Easter Vigil. <laughs> that said, the liturgical guide that Katie read had us joking around about how very Halloween-y today's stories seem to us. Both stories, Lazarus and the Valley of Dry Bones, are a little like that wonderful animated movie, Coco. Do you know it? It's about the Day of the Dead. It's wonderful. I recommend it. But then as we continued to joke and laugh and talk about this at the staff meeting, it started to feel like something really important wanted to be noticed and talked about. Something important about death. Now, our society has a relatively nervous and awkward relationship with death, don't you think? We think twice before bringing a kid to a funeral as if this essential ritual is somehow like rated PG-13. Or we quietly replace the goldfish or the gerbil with a look-alike before the kids get home from school. <clears throat> Don't worry, kids. None of your parents has ever done that because parents who avoid talking about death don't bring their kids to church on Valley of Dry Bones Lazarus Sunday. <clears throat> Not knowingly, anyway. But people who knowingly come to church on Valley of Dry Bones Lazarus Sunday are ready to look more closely at death. And those who end up here by accident perhaps were blown in by the Holy Spirit for a reason. We can't read these stories with any sort of attentiveness without investigating our own relationship with death. The deaths that we have grieved, the deaths on the news, far too many yet again this week. Our own future death or the death of Jesus on the cross. Other kinds of death ask to be acknowledged here too. The death of integrity in every act of prejudice. The death of faith when the faithful find themselves excluded from a place of worship. The death of hope when despair takes over. The death of trust or the death of connection when relationships come to an end. Oh, my friends, death is all over the place. And we live in a society that has taught us to deny this fundamental reality. We have been fed a steady diet of shallow media and trite memes and romantic comedies that make relationships look simple, causing us to think that we must avoid the harder things lest they reveal our inadequacy at achieving what we've seen on those screens. Our history has been sugar-coated for the comfort of the privileged so that we don't have to see and come to terms with that which we and our ancestors have done, the deaths that we have caused unnecessarily. In regards to actual death, we've moved the ritual of tending and dressing a body from living rooms to funeral homes, from family members to undertakers, our health care system invests more in life-prolonging measures than it does in peaceful end-of-life care. We speak of someone passing rather than naming death. We weave cute poetry around grief as if it's just another Hallmark movie that we can cry over and then be just fine the next day. But our faith invites us to something deeper something more authentic, not just for the sake of being real, but so that we can go deeper and access something incredibly restorative and joyful. For without acknowledging grief, we can't access fullness of life. We need to hold grief, and we need to grieve the old goldfish if we are to be open to the belovedness of the new goldfish. And I don't say that to be cute, but rather to show that we begin this very important journey with the smallest of things at the youngest of ages. We grieve a relationship when it ends in order to tend the soil of our hearts for new relationships. 
We grieve the death that we bear witness to on the news in order to maintain our connection as humans in the family of humanity. We read the Passion of Christ each year, twice, once next Sunday, and again on Good Friday, and we sit at the foot of the cross washed in the injustice and the loss and the deep love that Christ revealed to us on that cross so that Easter can be deeply, deeply joyful, like the voice of a child, and even more so. So that Easter can be more than a nice outfit and some Easter eggs and a real good old story so that we can truly feel the joy, the new life, the extreme hope, and the pure love that God ha has for each and every one of us. Ezekiel described how dry and lifeless those bones were before he told us that they rattled back together and became something new. The Spirit of God breathed into them and they stood in a multitude on a land that God gave them gave to people who had been made landless. Jesus was greatly disturbed and he wept. It's the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept, all before he brought Lazarus back to life. And Lazarus, oh, he began to decompose. There was a stench before he exited his tomb and was unbound and set free. And Jesus went through far too much agony, was tended to by his friends and laid in a tomb and grieved by those who loved him. And then he rose to new life and promised us the same. I don't think that we can even begin to grasp the expansiveness of new life if we avoid death. I don't think we can begin to evolve this world toward God's dream if we can't name what has gone terribly wrong. And I don't think Easter makes any sense if we can't look the pain of Good Friday in the eye. I wanna end by telling you something beautiful that Brian Mohammed said in Bible study this week. And you know, just jump up and correct me if I misquote you. After we spoke of how close Jesus was to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, the three siblings in the village of Bethany that Jesus spent so much time with, Brian said, it's all about relationship, all of this. This was a really good relationship. And Brian went on to recall how Mary washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair and how Jesus wept with Martha and Mary, and then gave them their brother back. In listening to Brian, the whole thing started to feel viscerally tender, this relationship offered by Jesus in a world full of death and life. And he offers this relationship to us too. We can fully access this beautiful gift of a relationship with God through Christ when we are willing to face death and invite Jesus to pour new life into us, into every fiber of our being. Because when we face death, we take away its power over us, making way for the perpetual victory of love, making way for relationship with God and fullness of life. Amen. us rise and join our siblings around this world in affirming our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, and I invite you to use the pronouns that speak to your heart and your theology. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, 
begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, they are worshiped and glorified. They have spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all the people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our bishops and for our clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all the authority, let us pray to the Lord. For the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphans, and for the sick and suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for the prisoners and captives, for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, especially those we name now. And for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. Lord, have mercy. We also offer up the specific prayers of intercession and thanksgiving that we have brought with us today. I invite you to offer your prayers at this time. We pray for everybody on our parish prayer list. Walter. In this place, we hold up the prayers being offered into chats and comments online. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you, my own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Maker and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. My friends, checking in before you actually touch anyone, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Peace.
have a seat. We have just a couple of announcements before we roll on with Eucharist. There is coffee hour after the service. I'm not sure if there's food to eat, but someone made coffee. So uh, if, you're, if your brief interactions just now during the piece weren't enough, please go downstairs and continue to be with one another down there. Um, for all who came to the All Parish meeting last week and all who helped to make that happen, thank you. If you want to know more about that, read our weekly email that just came out on Friday, a little letter from our wardens, and a place to click if you want to get involved in our upcoming project. We'd love to have everyone do that. Um, and uh, if you don't get the weekly email, email us at info at stpaulsnatic.org and we'll put you on it because we'd love to have everyone in the loop on all the things that we do. Um, Holy Week is coming, and Dan is going to say a couple things about that in a moment. First of all, the schedule for Holy Week is on the back of your bulletin. You can bring it home. Um, a, if you can find at least three typos, you get an A+. Uh, I will say that that schedule just, I realized there was an, an available page in the bulletin, so I typed it up and sent it off. If you can tell me how Holy Week it could be called Whole Week, <laughs> theologically, you get an A++. Um, and I hope that you will engage that week of wonderful services and deep space to live out our faith and till the soil for the joy of Easter. Dan, would you come and say another word about that? Thanks. So I'm Dan Fields. I'm one of the co-wardens here. Um, I did want, as Becky had said, direct you, your attention to the back of the bulletin. Um, on Good Friday, um, St. Paul's and St. Andrew's in Framingham, we are um, publicizing what we're offering on that day, what they're offering that day at different times. So um, uh, for the noon Good Friday service here and the two o'clock Good Friday Stations of the Cross, we're inviting them to those if they would like to come. And then at four o'clock, St. Andrew's is having a Children's Station of the Cross and at 7.30, a Good Friday service so we're invited to those two if we'd like to come. So if you do see people from St. Andrews here, please be welcoming. And I believe, are we inviting them to the great, to the great, yes, to the vigil on, um, on Saturday night. So again, if you see other folks here you haven't seen before, please, please be welcoming. Thank you. Oh, and uh, for the Easter egg hunt um, is happening between the uh, nine o'clock service and 11 o'clock service on Easter. Uh, please bring filled eggs. I think we may have some, empty. yes, in the back. Um, and we're gonna have a, a bin outside of Gale House. You can put those in or just bring them to church. So anyway, next uh, Sunday, feel free to bring those uh, and then we'll have the egg hunt outside uh, on Easter. Thank you. If you're trying to remember any of that information, do check our website and those weekly emails. Um, everybody is welcome to Eucharist, which we are about to engage, and uh, whoever you are, wherever you've been, wherever you've come from, please know that you're welcome at God's table. Um, and a couple of your options are to sit and listen to the music, to come forward and cross your arms for a blessing, um, and then of course all are welcome to receive communion. Just put your hands out and I will give you some bread. Let me know if it needs to be gluten-free. And, uh, and then following me are gonna be two of our lay Eucharistic ministers. We have three lay Eucharistic ministers today. Two of them are in training and we're so happy to have new people in that ministry. Um, so one of them will be holding a chalice. I think Nathan will be holding the chalice. If you like to sip wine, just make eye contact with Nathan and, um, and he will serve you the wine. If you like to dip your wafer in the bread, is Monica going to be holding? Monica will be holding a little bowl. Um, just to indicate to her that you want to dip, hold your wafer up, and she'll be looking for people holding their wafers up ready to dip. We don't dip and sip in the same vessel since, um, since the pandemic. Um, and if you get confused, it's just a symbol of our human fallibility and why we come to the table in the first place. Just ask clarifying questions. We'll, we'll get it done. Um, I think that's it. Walk in love as Christ loves us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. On page 361. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Creator, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who was tempted in every way as we are, yet did not sin. By his grace, we are able to triumph over every evil and to live no longer for ourselves alone, but for him who died for us and rose again. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and maker of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. We call in his life, death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. The gifts of God for the people of God, take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving, knowing that all are welcome at God's table.
page 365, let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace. And grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. My friends, life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of our fellow pilgrims along the way. So be swift to kind, make haste to be loving, and may the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit be with you and those you love today and always. Amen. Our final hymn is also in your bulletin, In This Dry Land. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.